So as an example of how science and society move together, I think it's important to think about at first um, how we do regular computation. And I think about this as kind of a choice of bits, like what are the underlying units of computation. So uh, underlying units of computation were originally gears, because humans were really good at building gears. Their applications changed in time. So these gears from the ancient Greeks were used basically for astrology. They wanted to better compute locations of planets and moons and stars to better advise their leaders. So for quantum computing, it's kind of the same thing. We actually have a lot of quantum bits. Um, some of the initial experiments in quantum computing were done in a nuclear magnetic resonance machine. Uh, I know some of you, or you know someone in your family who's gone to have an MRI done. An MRI is a nuclear magnetic resonance <coughs> imager, but they knew that patients wouldn't like to hear the word nuclear. So they just struck the N off and made it an MRI. It's basically a big magnet, and what it looks at is it actually looks at quantum states of hydrogen spins in your body. And that's how it makes its image, which is kind of amazing. Now, because NMRs and MRIs are good for so many things, they already had all the control infrastructure to do quite complicated <coughs> quantum experiments, which is why at the beginning of quantum computing experimentally, a lot of work was done on NMR. Nowadays, uh, it's spread on to thinking about ways to put photons together. These are each individual atoms that can be controlled. You can think about electrons um, controlled inside of solid state quantum dots, um, atomic ions, and superconducting qubits. Um, and at the moment, I would say that um, atomic ions, which I work on, and superconducting qubits, which uh, Google and IBM and Intel work on, are the leading candidates for how to build a quantum computer right now. All right, so um, just briefly, I want to talk a little bit about the difference. So classical computation, the key thing is, it's just basically a bunch of answers to yes or no questions. So you have the bits storing a zero or one, things are true or false. If I do a computation, in this case, I have a bit string and I'm adding one, I map a bit string to a bit string. So everything you do in your computer, whether you're on YouTube or social media or you know working on your MATLAB or writing your essay, all it's doing is mapping zeros and ones to zeros and ones. That's all it does at a fundamental level. Um, if we measure the strings of zeros and ones, nothing happens. We get to keep that string and use it later. And then most importantly, we can copy it. So you know you should always back up your data any way you can, so that if one device goes down, you can get that information from another <coughs> device. In a quantum computer, um, information is stored in a quantum bit. And what it means is that you can have sort of like, uh, you have technically a superposition of zero and one, and then A and B can actually be complex numbers. And that complex number is what you should think about it is it means it's a weight. So I like to think, so classical computing, is like a set of information. Quantum computing is effectively a wave of information. So now, when we, count, when we do this computation, what we do is we map superpositions of bit strings to superpositions of bit strings. So in this case, I can have these two different numbers. And when I add one, I add one to both numbers at exactly the same time. So in the popular press, um, you will often read that quantum computer is very powerful because it can do infinitely number of computations in parallel. And what this is what they're talking about. What's uh, is, you know as a specialist, what's frustrating in the popular press is how to get from that to an answer is actually quite hard, and that's actually the challenge of building really good quantum algorithms. And the reason why it's hard is that here, if I measure okay, what output did I get? I either get this number which is four, or this number, which is five. And that's it. I don't get four and five. Um, so that's, that's, that's a challenge. And then the second thing is the state cannot be copied. So if in the middle of your algorithm, you're like, ah, I'm not sure what I want to do next. I'll just copy the state and maybe try a bunch of things. You actually is forbidden by, by quantum computing, quantum mechanics. Um, and so these are kind of limits, I would say. And now, of course, the quantum computer totally subsumes the classical computer. Because as long as I don't make these superpositions of bits, I can do everything on this side. Um, but this is, is why it's challenging to think about this. 
So when I think about kind of what you need to build a quantum <coughs> computer, um, you need ways to control bits and qubits, um, you need ways to, to measure their outcomes, and then you need some way to scale to many, many possible quantum bits. And the reason, the challenge I would say right now is primarily scalability for ions and superconductors. I think for some of those other technologies that I mentioned, they still have trouble with, say, their two qubit gates are not as good as I'd like to see. Um, so what makes it hard to build? So the problem is, you know, humans didn't, basically humans didn't find quantum mechanics until the beginning of the 20th century. Why not? What were we doing for those hundreds of thousands of years? Well, the problem is, day to day, everything seems really classical. And the reason it seems really classical is that these quantum states are very fragile. So just a little bit of noise really ruins it. Um, so what I wanted to try to get across in the next couple of slides is like, why, why now are all these companies and everybody so excited? Like, what is happening? <laughs> So quantum computing basically, um, there were some early ideas in the 80s. Uh, it became really somehow important when in 1994, Peter Shore showed that you could factor really large numbers very efficiently with a quantum computer. And that's important because a lot of our internet security relies on the hardness of factoring a really large number into its primes. So if you had a quantum computer, mathematically we know it would work quite fast. But we also already knew that things were noisy. And so actually, uh, Peter Shore, um, Steen, and then Robert Calderbank, who's a professor here at Tube, in the 90s showed how you could make arbitrarily long computations by, doing, by, by using error correcting codes. And then Daniel Gottesman really formalized this in his PhD thesis nicely. And so what's great is we had a way where you could take classical codes that we knew about and generate a quantum code which could fix against all of these problems we could have. Now, classically, when we think about the storage of information, um, we can also think about storing information in, in materials that are very resilient. So my favorite example is always like Mesopotamians versus Egyptians. So Egyptians wrote everything on paper. We don't know as much as we should. Mesopotamians wrote everything on stone. We know we have like crazy stories of like parents divorcing their children which I guess you could do in Mesopotamia, which we only know because they wrote it in stone. Uh, interesting. It's, it's very interesting to me. So, so, you know, one way to store digital information is magnetically. Um, so, I'm, you know, very soon, I mean, this is almost already an antiquarian slide since nobody has a magnetic hard drive anymore, right? But, the, uh, but people were curious, could you make kind of the equivalent of a magnetic hard drive for storing quantum information? And the answer was kind of disappointing, which is they found that it had to be a four-dimensional object. And since we live in three-dimensional space, it was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so what's amazing to me, and I think like a great example of, um, of basic science, this, this idea of these four-dimensional stable memories, and then a very weird idea, which is what if people, there's a type of material that if you can make it, Someone could do computation, quantum computation, only by measuring it. Like you don't do any operations. The material itself somehow already has all the correlations for all possible computations. So two guys, Rosendorf and Harrington, put those two, two ideas together. And they realized that if I had just kind of normal uh, system of qubits in two dimensions, I could make something like a quantum hard drive as long as I had feedback. And, um, and what's great is that like, un like previously, instead of having to have gates that were good to part per million, you only had to have gates that were good to about 1%. And the way they did operations was all really strange. There's like holes in this paper and they like twist things around each other and that's how the computation happens. Um, but this was, a, I think, really a seminal result. Because before that, only crazy optimists like me were interested in quantum computing. Because I was like, we can get to a part per million, why not? Now at 1%, <laughs> anyone, anyone could do it. Shortly after that, kind of two things happened. So on the superconducting qubit side of things, um, their gates and ion trap gates both got to better than 1%. So because of the previous result, we knew getting to 1%, everything should work. So right now, we're in this huge growth of industry. Here at Duke, um, 
I'm really interested in ion trap quantum computing. We have this National Science Foundation grant, which we just call Stack. Uh, these ions, each of these ions are individual atoms. They live above these like surface trap chips. And we, we have prototypes already here at Duke, and we're working at building these up to roughly 30 to 60 qubits. So then I just want to end with a couple of news stories. So that's uh, oh, too red. Um, anyway, it's nice to have the Herald Sun come by and say that we were actually taking on IBM. That was <laughs> pleasant. And so Jung Sun Kim and I had this, this is our ion trap lab. And even Marvian just started as a, an assistant professor in electrical and computer engineering and physics. And then, you know, this Wired article, which came out this summer, I really like this quote, right? Of all of America's issues right now, it was quantum computing that brought Democrats and Republicans together this summer. And so if I can reduce partisan rancor, I feel like my job here is done. Thank you.